everyone, this is Joshua Smith of Apollo's Artifacts. It is December of 2021. In this episode, we're going to take a historical stroll down a path into something very dark, disgusting, and evil that involved a huge pharmaceutical corporation and various governments around the world. Since so many people choose to trust such entities today, I think that trust deserves to be broken. If you're not shocked by what you hear in this episode, you may want to seek psychological counseling. So there was a huge scandal that began in the 1970s and dated up into the 1980s with lasting effects until today, involving a particular product for hemophiliacs called Factor 8. Factor 8 helps out with the blood clotting mechanism that hemophiliacs lack. But what happened in this scandal from the 1970s to the 1980s is that many samples of Factor 8 was actually contaminated with the blood of prisoners, prostitutes, and active homosexuals who were not using protection during sex acts. The procedure of obtaining the blood from these individuals was very much intentional because it was cheap and it would make lots of money for the company once they sold it on the international markets. All of this is backed up with substantial amounts of documentation from a variety of legal cases that followed. Now I will roll a couple of news reports here to sort of set the scene for you further. This is from Scarborough Country, before Joe Scarborough actually lost his mind and completely went off the deep end into crazy country. Mike, welcome to the show. We appreciate you being on tonight. Thanks for the invitation, Joe. Okay, let's talk about the rat of the week. Why is Bear Corporation the rat of the week? Internal documents show that after this company positively, absolutely knew that they had a medication that was infected with the AIDS virus, they took the product off the market in the U.S. and then they dumped it in France, Europe, Asia, and Latin America. The medicine's called Factor 8. It was an, inject an injection medicine that was used for hemophiliacs, mostly children. Children. children had been born with an incurable disease. Hold on, disease. hold on, Mike. So, hold on, hold on. So you're yeah. telling me that Bear knew that this drug was infected with the AIDS virus. At they yanked it from the market in America, and then they dumped it in markets overseas? They had to figure out a way, Joe, to make a profit on a product that they could not sell in America. So they made a huge profit. They, jumped, they dropped the product in Japan, Spain, and France. By the way, Joe, government officials in France that allowed that to happen actually had to go to prison for in America, not one corporate executive for this company has been indicted or even criminally investigated by our Justice Department. Why not? What, you're telling me that these people that dumped this AIDS-tainted blood in foreign countries yes. who killed children have not been have not been taken to task in the it's, United States it, it's worse than that the US government allowed it to happen the FDA allowed this to happen and now the government is completely looking the other way thousands of innocent hemophiliacs have died from the AIDS virus and not only they're dying their family members are dying because they're becoming infected with the disease so I hope you caught that there the critical part where he said not only did Bayer knowingly do this infect and kill people all around the world, but also the FDA knew about it, and they allowed this to happen too. Not only that, but he also mentioned the other foreign countries where their governments allowed this to happen to their people as well. And if you've never heard of this situation, you ought to sit back for a minute and just ask yourself, why have I never heard of this? Because I guarantee you, you won't hear it on MSNBC today. You won't hear it on CNN or ABC, or CBS, or any of the other usual suspects. So now let's take a look and listen to a report here from Sky News. This is a very good investigative piece that they did, but always, as usual, there's still a little bit of sleight of hand going on here because they never actually mention the pharmaceutical company that was involved in this. Let's watch. It is a scandal that has already claimed thousands of lives. Our lives were shut. Shut us and many more will die before a public inquiry reaches its conclusion. Every year there's less and less and less of you. But after a 40-year wait for answers... I'd like to think that they will find the truth. The stories of the victims, living and dead, are finally being heard. Yeah, and that's the moment, and that was headmaster's office. Like Staff that. rooms. Yeah. Aide Steve and Gary have returned to the school that was supposed to transform their lives, but ended up threatening them. Or going into hospital and being treated like something with yeah. rabies. Well, that's not we, 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 Trelaws College is a specialist school that in the 1970s and 80s 
welcomed haemophiliac boys. Through those green doors, and Through that's those. where the college ends and the haemophilia the medical centre begins. Yeah. begins. Yeah. It offered an education and revolutionary treatment. But in an NHS-run clinic, they were given contaminated blood products that gave them HIV and hepatitis C. Of more than 80 boys, they are among just 16 who are still alive. When I first arrived here, it was incredible. It was the most amazing place I'd ever seen. 35 acres of countryside, a great big mansion, Jacobean mansion, doctors, physios, nurses, treatment on demand. It was an amazing place for a 10-year-old boy to be. It was a great time. Um, you grew up with your friends from the age of 10 until 18. Um, we played football, cricket. 100% attendance record because if you had a bleed and had to have be transfused with your injections, that would take between 15 minutes and half an hour and you would literally go back to school. Just after breakfast, about just about quarter to nine, half eight, something like that, we'd all prance down to the sick bay stand outside the door and then you'd go in and there'd be three or four tables ready with syringes on full of factor eight. Bearing in mind we were children, eight, nine years old and uh, we weren't really told a lot about it really. Um, they just said there's this new product on now and um, it's going to change your life um, and yes it did at that time but obviously now we realise that it's killed a lot of us. We were told that for some of us in that room had HIV and they told us by going around the room saying you have, you haven't, you have, you haven't, you have. I was told that I had HIV in 83. Um, um, me and friend Steve just went in the room and matter of factly you've been infected with um, HIV, we don't know anything about it um, and we can't say for certain how long you're going to live for. Around 1983-1984 when the link had been made uh, between HIV AIDS and haemophilia, overnight haemophilia became a dirty word. Um, we were scared, we, we could see what was going on, we realised this link had been made and it could be us. I'm the last remaining person alive in that room today. It was difficult to come back to the reunions and things like that because you're not sure who's going to be there. It's destroyed everyone's lives. The Infected Blood Inquiry is examining what happened to the Trelaws boys and to nearly 5,000 other people infected in the UK. Nearly 3,000 of them have died. Some of their names recorded in this memorial at the inquiry's headquarters. Contaminated Factor VIII, made from blood plasma, was imported in the 1970s and 80s, much of it from the United States, where it was collected from prisoners, sex workers and drug users who were paid for their blood. Professor, Are you beginning to wrap your mind around how evil this was? How evil this is? This is the evil that makes up our world today not just with Bayer, but with every other one of these corporations, too. And the governments. I'll let it continue. Ted Tudnam was a senior haematologist at the Royal Free Hospital in London. He says that Factor VIII promised to revolutionise the treatment of haemophilia. Having a apparently clean, concentrated, stable, easily available, readily made up, easily infused product was an enormous advance, not just in convenience, but in efficacy. He says he had no idea about contamination until it was too late. The um, awareness that we, so many of our patients had been infected was uh, devastating. Uh, the patients were beginning to die. Lee Turton was diagnosed with haemophilia at six months old. He contracted HIV from factor eight, aged four. He died when he was ten. When they called us in to speak to us, um, the consultant just said straight away, we've done a blood test, he's HIV positive, and we know as much as you know. But we'd already, months before that, been asking how safe the treatment was, because we'd heard that 
it was in the blood products. I was to say up to four, four and a half. He was fine, five. But then, of course, the, the issues with the school, you know, and that would affect him. And then it started hurting him inside. That you know, his friends would didn't want to speak to him, didn't want to go near him. Teachers didn't want to teach him, and the press were pestering the house. We had to move in the end because we, we even. Walking, you know, if you went to the shops, there was um, people wouldn't go near you, and then there was a couple of people that said he'd be better off dead. It seemed to come very quickly in the end, you know. All right, let's say 18 months, two years, he started started to fade on us. Somebody had robbed him of his childhood, and he, he was dying in front of our eyes, and we just couldn't do anything. And every time we took him to the hospital because he wasn't feeling very well. It just, nobody seemed to care. I feel guilty, maybe I should have, you know, um, done more for him. We put our trust in the hospitals, the doctors, which uh, maybe I should have asked more questions. I blame the pharmaceutical companies, I blame the civil servants and I blame the government because they covered it all up for profit. And she's 100% right there. The companies did cover it up, and the governments did cover it up, and they always do this. It's why you cannot trust them. Do you think they're incentivized to tell the truth, to be honest? Of course they're not. Establishing who was responsible for the greatest treatment scandal in the history of the NHS is a central question for the inquiry. It is a huge undertaking, the largest public inquiry ever conducted in the UK, with around 150 staff combing through records dating back 40 years and more than a thousand witness statements. These are just some of almost two and a half million pages of NHS records that will be examined by the inquiry and there are more than five million more documents from other agencies yet to come, all part of the process of establishing what doctors, officials and ministers knew about contaminated blood and when they knew it. Survivors, victims and their families have long suspected a cover-up and they want the inquiry to ask questions right at the very top. There's absolutely no doubt that uh, former Prime Ministers have to be questioned as to why this happened. And um, the in initial uh, views taken by the uh, Thatcher administration were um, carried on by, the, um, by her successor, John Major. And John Major is still alive and kicking, and certainly the victims are very, very keen to see him called to give evidence and answer the questions which they feel they have wanted to ask him for the last 40 years. But there's a nice variety there. Simon Hamilton is chairman of Haemophilia Northern Ireland. He was infected with hepatitis C and has cirrhosis of the liver. Emotionally and physically, uh, on me directly, it has had a number of impacts. Um, I'm currently going through counselling support. It's like a, the top of a jar being knocked off now that the public inquiry is there and all these emotions which I thought I, I didn't have or I thought I had controlled, those, those, those have come out. Every six months I'm tested to see if there's a, a, a tumour or the start of a tumour, uh, which means liver cancer and then the consequences of that. So for me, those are the realities. The reality for my family, my son, my wife, uh, they, bear, they bear the worry and uh, they also watch and, and they live with that too. So it's, and it's shared with my mother and my brothers. My twin brother ended up with liver cancer and required a transplant and I was with him through all of that. That is something I wouldn't wish on anyone. Um, and there are many people who've gone through that, who've gone through that. Uh, and for them, I, I shed tears. And for those who did not survive, I shed tears. I'm angry, yes, I'm, I, I'm, I, I feel betrayed by those who had a responsibility of due diligence to look after people like me and those uh, others who are not here any longer. Like every other victim, he knows this may be the best and last chance for answers. Um, the brothers and sisters, if you like, in this process, I don't think we'll settle for another whitewash. I'm determined to find the truth and the truth will come out.
We've lost so many people. So yes, the promise and the bonds that were made, this is what this is about. The people that actually did cover up what happened should be punished. Hopefully this inquiry will give us some justice and some peace. And from there, I'll move into a number of the articles that have covered this over the years. So this is from January of 2011 from CBS News Money Watch. The headline is, Bayer admits it paid millions in HIV infection cases, just not in English. The article begins here, To read the English-speaking media, you'd never know that Bayer just paid tens of millions of dollars to end a three-decade-long scandal in which the company sold HIV-contaminated blood products to hemophiliacs, thousands of whom later died of AIDS. But as you read down in the details of the article here, you of course see the lead buried, as usually happens. Quote, the company accepts no responsibility in this case and continues to insist that it has always acted responsibly and ethically. This is despite the fact that Discovery uncovered documents, which I will show you here. There are 59 documents that you can access here, which show the behind-the-scenes meetings, the minutes, if you will, of their sales team members meeting and discussing this. What do we do with it? When people propose the idea that, well, we should just uh, eliminate this stuff, get rid of it, they say, oh, no, 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 that would cost us too much money. We're just going to sell this overseas, and we won't tell anybody what's in it or what's wrong with it, and we'll just let them suffer and die, basically. That's, of course, my interpretation. And, of course, I'll have all of this linked below so that you can access all of these documents for yourself, and you can see exactly what it was they were saying and that they did this with full knowledge and culpability. Completely evil. And if you go down a bit further, you can see that this is actually a separate out-of-court settlement, which they had uh, paid one previously back in 1997, and all of this was so quietly covered up and moved right past the American public as well. And here we have a small snippet from the Hemophilia Society, and this is uh, regarding the cases in England. And it shows that uh, out of all of those that were infected, that only 250 or so are still living, meaning that many, many of the others who were infected died as a result of this contaminated blood. And uh, usually... Wikipedia isn't particularly reliable, but the, and they actually have a pretty decent entry on this case here since so much of it has been substantiated over the years with court documents. They have a section here about the continued sales of the product, and then they list the various countries where people became infected. Canada, France, Iran, Iraq, Ireland, Italy, Japan, Portugal, the UK, United States, and there's actually a number of third world nations as well that aren't listed here, but I will cover when I get to a bigger article on this. Here you can even go to the Huffington Post, and they actually have a significant entry here on this uh, scandal of the contaminated blood. Here you can see article after article after article covering this over the years. I will link this below as well. Here I think is a good spot to take a listen to one of the victims themselves following the others that you saw earlier. This is from the BBC. I was infected, <coughs> excuse me, in 1982 when I was five years old. Um, we, we know now that the, um, the blood transfusions were known to be infected, but um, they were being used anyway. My parents weren't told until I was about seven or eight years old. Did they know you'd been infected? They did. They did. It's shown on my medical records that they knew for quite a while before my and parents were informed. And you infected with? With HIV and hepatitis C. And hepatitis B, for that matter, yes. Right. And they didn't think to tell your parents? Well, it seems to be a trend across the country that people were not told um, as soon as they were infected. And, and there's one good reason for this, a terrible reason, and one terrible consequence as well. The reason is that we know that um, patients were being monitored for infectivity trials, especially people who'd never been treated before, because they didn't... Did you catch what he just said there? The government knew who was infected, and they intentionally did not tell them so that they could see how the disease progressed in these people. Does this sound familiar at all? Does this sound like the Tuskegee syphilis study? know how the progress of the disease would um, would be transmitted in blood and we have a letter to say that actually human trials were cheaper than chimpanzees in that case um, and the terrible consequence was of course that people who were sexually active and in relationships right, were infecting their partners infecting and we, we have several people that were infected during right. that, that terrible time Gosh. yes okay do you get that they let these people go out and infect 
other people too. The sheer evil of this is beyond belief. And to think, you still trust these people? You trust them when they get on TV and they tell you to take the COVID vaccines? Are you out of your freaking minds? Gosh. Um, how are you now? Uh, um, I'm, I'm recovering. I was, I was um, diagnosed with full-blown AIDS when I was 16 and missed uh, about four years of my life being in hospital and expecting to die until new, new um, contamination, uh, sorry, new combination the therapies, therapies came out, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, but slowly I've been recovering since right. then and um, I, I'm pleased to be able to be here now as part of the contaminated blood uh, grouped a tainted blood, yes. What did it mean when David Cameron made that apology? Because it, 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 a, lot of, a lot of us thought the issue had then been yeah. dealt with. Or... Yeah. Well, I think a lot of us did as well. Um, obviously, that was David Cameron's last speech in his last PMQs in which he made those promises. Um, but since then, his um, apology has been found to be pretty hollow. It's meaningless, really. The, the other pledges that he made at the time to settle this, both financially and, um, right. you know, to settle it as far as justice is concerned, have been put, pushed aside. Right. So you, you've you been to... What's the, the legal situation here? Because a lot of people would say, well, you, you know, you yeah. take the NHS to court and you get decent compensation. Yes. They've, they've done something pretty awful and it's... it's it... OK, so in 1990, we took the NHS to court. Um, it was my parents at the time. Right. Um, people were dropping like flies, and so they came up with um, a settlement, an out-of-court settlement, in which we were forced to f sign waivers. Mm. Um, so it's basically saying that we wouldn't, um, you wouldn't sue for any further. Um, and, and people needed the money urgently because they they did, they but didn't nobody knew about hepatitis therapy. C at that point. Right. And so. Uh, the government did, but we didn't, and so they made us sign the waivers so that we would. So you not can't sue go back. You can't go back for more money, which is why you want now. Yes, it's our only route: a judicial inquiry, or um, right. as Andy Burnham puts forward, because you can't. You basically you've waved away the right to go back. Indeed, to yes, yes. Oh, it's, it's a really interesting uh, case, uh, Andy. Thank you so much for thank coming. You. Thanks. But notice, even when they tell the truth about these things, that there are other things that pass right by that are always being covered up. It's always. Well, we'll just isolate it to just this singular event or just this singular company. And they always want to leave people with the impression that, well, it was only this one time and this one place or this one group of people. And basically, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Just go on with your life. Everything's going to be fine. This is being dealt with now that we know that it took place. But that's the true danger and the true tragedy of the whole thing is that it is still embedded within an overall structure of deception. Because do you think this is all that Bayer's ever been involved with that's bad? Let's take a look at this. The Holocaust Encyclopedia, key facts. And look at Bayer's role in the Holocaust. Do you think it was only Bayer? What about BASF? What about IBM? Here's another article from the Irish Times. Bayer accused of involvement in Nazi medical experiments on Jews. Here's another from the Los Angeles Times from 1999. Suit alleges bare role in Holocaust experiments. And we'll get down here to the key part of the accusation. According to the suit, quote, Bayer provided toxic chemicals to the Nazis. Some of those experiments involved injecting concentration camp inmates with toxic chemicals and germs known to cause diseases in order to test the effectiveness of various drugs manufactured by Bayer. Sound like this uh, type of experiment has been repeated by them or other corporations in recent times? And here's another article interviewing the gentleman who we saw earlier in the video. I will have this link below as well. And if you think the evil ends there, take a look at this one. Here's the headline. It's an absolute bloody disgrace. New tainted blood shock. Charity set up to help after NHS HIV scandal profited from victims. Loan Trust took stake of houses and is still demanding repayment. A charity created to support victims of an NHS scandal that left nearly 3,000 people dead was making a profit from dying patients. The McFarland Trust was set up in 1988 by the government to help patients with hemophilia who had been infected with HIV from contaminated blood. The charity handed out monthly payments and emergency grants using cash from the Department of Health, but it has emerged the MFT was also entering into equity deals with desperate victims at risk of losing their homes. So in other words, they were trapping these people, taking their property away from them, and basically just leaving them for dead, along with the companies that had actually infected them and the government which was allowing it to happen. This is evil compounded upon evil upon other evil. Here's another article about this topic, Contaminated Blood Scandal. It was avoided 
unavoidable, now historic inquiry must uncover the truth. But unfortunately, this inquiry didn't accomplish very much whatsoever. And here you can see a photograph of another one of the victims who died at just the age of 37 from AIDS. And here you find out it wasn't just hemophiliacs either. It also included new mothers who were given life-saving blood after childbirth. Terrible. And here's the final one from the Guardian Bear Division knowingly sold HIV-infected protein. And even here you can see that the total payouts as of 2003 were only around some $600 million. But I imagine they made a lot more by selling it all around the world previously. And there's a very important peer-reviewed article about this titled Blood Money Bears Inventory of HIV-Contaminated Blood Products and Third World Hemophiliacs. Now, I can't open this here as you have to have institutional authorization, but I was able to gain that and I printed it off, so I'm going to read some of that to you. But I'll provide these links below in case you want to try to access this. So this was published in 2014 in Accountability and Research, Issue 21. The summary here says this article presents an overlooked case of research misconduct and violations of basic principles of medical and business ethics. Moving down a bit further, it says the financial investment in the product was considered too high to destroy the inventory. Thus, they sold the contaminated HAHF to overseas markets in Asia and Latin America without the precaution of heat treating the product recommended for eliminating the risk because uh, they thought this would just cost too much. So they were just going to throw the infected blood out there all over people. It's a blood sacrifice, really. Uh, in the introduction here, it says pharmaceutical companies uniformly claim to embrace moral values as one of their highest obligations to patients. Bayer, for example, claims to help patients around the world by preventing, alleviating, and curing disease as part of their mission, science for a better life, they say. Marketing strategies that are concealed from the public contrast sharply, however, with the image provided by public relations campaigns. Given the importance of what is known in relatively small legal circles as the HEMO case, we believe that a fuller account merits exposure in the biomedical literature. And I'm just going to skip around in this to hit some of the high points, or lowlights as it were. While the HEMO case involved human immunodeficiency virus infected hemophiliacs in the United States and abroad, our count below focuses attention on the marketing and distribution of contaminated blood products in Asia, the so-called dumping aspect of the larger body of cases litigated. But one of the key things that you find out here is that the courts actually sealed a no number of the documents. So with the 59 that I showed you before, there are actually many, many more beyond that that the government will not, for one reason or another, allow the public to even see. Here I'm going to move down to a paragraph on page 391 of this article. It is well known that individuals with a history of IV drug use, prisoners, and promiscuous gay males are at high risk for prevalence of viral diseases such as hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV that are transferred through exposure to human blood. As early as 1975, the connection between promiscuous gay males, sexual behavior, and the spread of hepatitis B infection was well known. Experts recommended that such individuals refrain from blood donations. Due to the risk of transmitting and thereby spreading deadly and debilitating diseases, the United States federal government passed a law between the late 1970s and early 1980s that required companies to obtain blood for manufacturing their blood products strictly from normal, healthy individuals. At that time, the main companies that produced AHF included as follows Cutter Laboratories, purchased by Bayer in 1974, thus it was Bayer's, Baxter Healthcare, Alpha Therapeutic Corporation, Armour Pharmaceutical Company, Aventi Bering, and Sventis. So there were lots of other companies involved in the scandal as well. In the 1980s, Cutter and other companies targeted categories of plasma donors, IV drug users, prison inmates, Skid Row residents, and promiscuous gay males to manufacture AHF because the donors were readily available and willing to sell their blood for cheap, and the demand was high. In other words, they targeted these vulnerable communities so that they could make profit, regardless of the horrendous consequences for others, such as the children that you see here. Skipping now further, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, promiscuous gay males and prisoners were widely exposed to hepatitis B, so acquiring plasma from those populations would likely harvest sufficient levels of antibodies to warrant selling these drugs and knowing that they were 
contaminated. A bit further down here it says, by 1982, the Centers for Disease Control's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report included the alarming discovery that hemophiliacs treated with AHF, meaning heterosexuals without a history of IV drug use, had contracted a rare form of pneumonia, frequently diagnosed in AIDS patients. The CDC noted that this type of pneumonia had not previously been reported among hemophilia patients who had no other underlying diseases and have not had therapy commonly associated with immunosuppression. Also in 1982, based on studies in which chimpanzees injected with AHF developed AIDS-like symptoms that included this type of pneumonia, it appears that Cutter or Bayer in particular had strong evidence that AHF could transmit HIV. In other words, by 1982, they had plenty enough reason to know that this was already taking place. And despite this fact, the company made the decision that they were not going to exclude those types of high-risk donors. And instead of following the advice to heat treat it or get rid of it, the company chose instead to continue to market the non-heat treated version manufactured from the pooled plasma of thousands of donors who were screened using only voluntary self-reporting methods. In other words, it was just uh, liar's papers. Dropping down a bit further, it says here, by May of 1984, however, the company had tested its own non-heat-treated AHF and determined that HIV survived the manufacturing process, but that HIV did not survive the heat-treated AHF viral deactivation process. The inconsistency in their position, we believe, is explained by the fact that this company wanted to protect its market share through sale of its inventory non-heat-treated AHF. And they actually went much further than that. This is in their 1985 marketing plan for the Far East. It says here, instead of destroying the high-risk non-heat-treated AHF in their inventories, the company determined that they would need to, quote, sell as much of it as possible even at marginal prices. The marketing plan lamented the fact that the company was forced to terminate its business in New Zealand in 1982 when AIDS became an issue, but optimistically they identified India, Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, Korea, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Burma, and Nepal as possible markets for their non-heat-treated AHF, thus the contaminated blood. Throughout Latin America, Argentina, Venezuela, Colombia, and Costa Rica were the main markets to which this was exported. Moving over to the next page, we find out appallingly that in Hong Kong, 40% of their pediatric hemophiliacs had tested positive for HIV. This is absolutely disgusting and outrageous. These are their children. Over on the next page, it says, In Taiwan alone, as alleged in the complaint filed, 34 Taiwanese hemophiliacs or partners of hemophiliacs developed AIDS as a result of infusing HIV-contaminated AHF. Many of those individuals later went on to die from AIDS complications. This was an absolutely murderous program. And I come down here finally to the conclusion. When Bayer acquired Cutter, it took ownership of assets and liabilities, including the legal liabilities that resulted from the thousands of HIV AIDS cases. Bayer paid over $600 million in settlements for what they have called in Taiwan, quote, humanitarian aid, rather than compensation for wrongful death. And I would say murder by any other name is what this is. In spite of over 2,700 cases worldwide litigated on the basis of dumping, the company maintained that they had behaved responsibly, ethically, and humanely. So just remember that next time you're listening to pronouncements from the FDA or CDC or Fauci or Pfizer or Moderna or any of the rest of these companies or these governmental agencies. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Thank you.